Well, good morning to everyone. Good to see you all here. Would you stand and sing with us this morning? Good morning. Welcome to Redeemer Community Church. Let's start out with a word of prayer. Father, we, uh, we, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for uh, this church and a, and a chance where we can just gather freely and worship you. Um, we thank you for e- each person you've brought here today. We pray that you would open our ears, let us hear from you uh, as we just humble ourselves before your word. Uh, it's in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, good morning again. If you are visiting with us this morning, we're glad you're here. Hopefully you received a visitor card. If you didn't, you can you know, raise your hand or pick one up in the back on your way out. We'd love for you to fill this out. This would let us get to know a little bit more about you. You can put them in the box in the back when you have them filled out. That's also our giving box for our regular tenders. You can put your tithes and offerings in there. Uh, today is kind of a special day for, for numerous reasons. One, it's Super Sunday. So, so kids, ages five to eight, after our, our worship time, you can join the cooks for Super Sunday in the back for kind of a special message. It's also our church business meeting and potluck lunch. So, you know, hopefully uh, you're, you're hungry. We've got some good food in the back. Plan on staying after church. We're going to discuss kind of strategic vision, vision for the church for the next year, as well as our uh, you know, kind of unveiling our new business plan, or our, our plans for the, the new building off of David O'Dodd. So please plan on staying. We'll wrap up by around 1.15, 1.30, I'm sorry, at the latest. So uh, please plan on staying for that. Because of that, there's no youth today, so no youth this afternoon. And then on, on Monday, so tomorrow, the ladies are going to gather for their monthly meeting. This is going to be just, they're going to focus on kind of encouraging the hearts of, of women and of each other. If you are new, you know, you're especially welcome, but, but all women are welcome. Plan on coming. It's at Jenny Malone's house. They're going to start at 7 o'clock. Where's, where's Jenny? If you don't know Jenny, she's not here. <laughs> she's preparing, yes. So, uh, somebody can point you out, Jenny. Please contact Jenny Malone if you if you have any questions or anything like that. We've coming up in May. We've got the the Family Life Weekend to Remember. So it's a kind of a marriage seminar. It's going to be the weekend of May the first. We would uh, we'd love for you guys to to be in, involved if you are interested in that. We've we've got a special kind of discount uh, if you contact the Meltons or the Divines. They can they can help kind of get you a hundred dollars off what your your normal cost would be. Uh, so we encourage you guys to sign up for that. And then lastly, if you are interested in becoming a member here at Redeemer, periodically we have member classes. So we're going to start that actually next Sunday, the 26th. It's going to be after the service. It goes from, uh, you know, around 1145 to 115 or so. Lunch and child care are provided. If you have any questions about the member class, <clears throat> and then also uh, if you plan on attending, please let Bob Lapine know. He just wants to get an a accurate count for lunch. Make sure that we can we can provide for everybody. So this morning, as we kind of begin looking at uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, I, I wanted to read just a little excerpt from from Isaac Pennington. He was a Quaker, joined the Quakers in about 1658. Uh, this is just a kind of a excerpt from a letter he wrote a friend, but but speaking kind of of the of the Spirit. So I'll read that as we prepare for worship this morning. Friend, it is a wonderful thing to witness the power of God as it reaches to the hearts and demonstrates to the soul the pure way of, to life. Surely the person who partakes of this power will be favored by the Lord. Therefore, we ought to wait diligently for the leadings of the Holy Spirit in everything we do. Thus, we will be able to, to travel through all that is contrary to God and into the things that are of God. It is also a wonderful thing to witness God's preservation that keeps us from sliding backwards and being entangled in traps of the enemy. For the enemy has many ways and uses many devices to ensnare our minds and draw it away from the truth. There our souls are lulled to sleep with false hopes as we lose the feeling and enjoyment of the true power of life. O oh friend, do not have a sense of the way to the Father? Then you must press your spirit to bow daily before God and to wait for the breathings to you from his spirit. Pray that he will continue his mercy to you and make his way more clear to you every day. Yes, and also pray that he will give you the strength in all trials which may come your way. By his secret workings in your spirit, giving you assistance from time to time, you will advance nearer and nearer towards the kingdom. Amen. Well, would you all stand with us? We are going to direct our hearts and our voices in praise to our God. Um, this, this first song that we sing may be new to some of you. I know, I think Kendall has introduced it to us a few weeks ago. It's called Hallelujah to My King. Uh, as we sing through the verses, we're really singing through a salvation story, praising Christ for what he has done. And then as we get to the choruses, we're going to be singing uh, hallelujah to our Savior. And a lot of times uh, in, in songs and in our praise, that's kind of where we end. We, we say, thank you, Jesus, for, for saving me. Uh, but this song is going to continue and say, hallelujah to my king. I owe everything to him. Wow. 
seated. Join me as we pray together this morning. Our Father, you are indeed holy and great and mighty, and your creation does declare your glory, and we stand in awe of you. Our soul finds joy and comfort and life and peace in the knowledge that you are good and kind and merciful, and that your steadfast love for your children endures forever. Father, we also want to acknowledge this morning that what we have just sung about ourselves is true. We are unworthy of your love. We say we love you and then we ignore you. We disregard you. We go about our daily lives focused on ourselves. We say we long for your kingdom to come and then we live our lives driven by the priorities of this life with little or no concern about eternal matters or priorities. We say we want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven and then we live our lives as if our will is what really matters. You have always provided for us whatever we have needed and yet we find ourselves anxious or fearful as we face our future. We doubt whether we can really trust you with everything. And you have graciously forgiven our sins. You have called us to forgive those who have sinned against us, and yet we continue to harbor bitterness or resentment. We hang on to offenses. We refuse to extend grace and mercy to others as you've extended grace and mercy to us. And we confess as well this morning that while you have set us free from the power of sin that we were once enslaved to, uh, we continue to fall into temptation, give in to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. So here we are again, Lord, confessing our sin to you. And we ask that even now you might bring to mind any specific sins that we need to confess as we pause here. Father, the only reason we can stand before you and confess these things is because we believe that your Son, our Lord Jesus, has paid the price for our sin. 
and that because of his death on our behalf, you are no longer angry with us, but instead you have adopted us as your children. We are forgiven and reconciled, and we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now stand and hear again the good news of the gospel. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things are new. Your sins, though they were scarlet, are now white as snow in Christ. Amen. time of singing with a, uh, a hymn written in the 1700s uh, by Charles Wesley, um, singing of Christ's uh, great love for us, God's great love for us, and um, 
So you may be familiar with the old tune, but we have uh, redone the melody. So perhaps we will throw you off for the first verse, but hopefully you'll be able to catch on soon.
Lord, we pray that you would receive our praise, our worship, as a sacrifice of our lips to you. You alone are worthy, and we worship and adore you. Amen. You can be seated. Before we uh, open our Bibles this morning and turn to the scriptures, I'm going to ask Bruce and Maria Goff to come up here. Uh, Casey mentioned that we are starting new members' classes in uh, a week, and we thought before we start the new new members' class, we ought to introduce the people who went through the old new members' class. We're nothing if not efficient here. It uh, may take a little while, but we get there eventually. So Bruce and Maria are one of the couples who were a part of the uh, new members class and are being welcomed as new members of Redeemer. So uh, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Good you're welcome. Here. Tell everybody, Bruce, about uh, where you grew up and a little bit about your family, okay? Okay. I grew up in upstate New York, uh, close to Canada and Vermont, in a very small town outside of Lake Placid, New York, where the greatest sports moment in history, according to Sports Illustrated, happened in 1980, the uh, Miracle on Ice. Yes. It was before my time, but yeah. still, I live there, <laughs> near there. Um, my parents are actually here visiting, and um, so grew up with them, and uh, <laughs> two sisters, and uh, I don't know what else. That's good. Maria, where did you grow up? Uh, well, I was born in Quebec, Canada, and I lived there till I was seven with no electricity and no running hot water. Seriously? <laughs> Seriously. Wow. Little... little uh, Laura Ingalls style kind of childhood but um and then also spent some time in New York and most of my most of my life was spent in North Carolina eastern North Carolina so eastern North Carolina upstate New York how do those two worlds merge Bruce uh well I took a job in Houston working in radio and there at church I met her sister and her sister's husband and they seemed to like me a lot and would have me over and ask me lots of questions about me and I thought, well, this is weird. Why do they care so much about me? <laughs> they forgot to mention that they had it, or that she had a sister, and so they were kind of vetting me, unbeknownst to me. And then uh, they invited, or Maria came out for a wedding, and they made sure that we met and hung out. And uh, yeah, their plan worked. And that's that's all it took. <laughs> yeah. So how long have you guys been married, Maria? Two and a half years. Any children? We have one on the way. Oh, that's great. When When's the due date? November 20th. Okay, that's exciting. And Bruce, uh, how did you come to faith? Well, I grew up uh, just up the street from a little Nazarene church, and so we'd go there every week and uh, went to VBS, uh, asked Jesus into my heart when I was five because I didn't want black spots on my heart. They showed a picture of a heart with black spots, and they said Jesus could wash those off. And I thought, well, I don't want black spots on my heart. So I asked Jesus to wash those off. Um, grew up listening to kids praise in the car all the time, Amy Grant. So that laid a good foundation. Um, had a good youth group growing up when I was about 14. But uh, the strange thing was, I thought I was a, a Christian because I gave up secular music. I broke my CDs. I... Uh, had to break my Blink-182 CD, so that put wow. me... Wow. Yeah, it was yeah. tough. So God owed me big time, so I, <laughs> so I thought that put me in good standing. But I can remember reading through the Bible and, and finding some things I totally disagreed with. And so even though all through high school I would have called myself a Christian because uh, I gave up secular music, so it clearly was, um, I can look back now and see my heart was not in a place where I loved God for God. Mm. You know, it was more what could I get out of God and... I doubted the Bible a lot, um, but when I was 20, a good friend gave me some CDs of some preaching from Leonard Ravenhill, Paris Reedhead, Ray Comfort, and um, that was when I finally started to understand, okay, this is not about me, this is about God's glory, and this this is about Him, and I am not, even though I broke my Blink-182 CD, I am not worthy of His love, in fact, I'm worthy of His judgment and I, that's when i really started to fear god mm. and then started to understand the gospel and i could see a change in my heart around 20 where i wanted god for god and i started to love god and hate sin and so maria how about you yeah. well i grew up in a christian home uh, as well and um you know was told the gospel from a young age and don't remember a time when i didn't love jesus and want jesus in my heart accepted jesus in my heart in sunday school when i was seven um, but like Bruce, it was kind of, you know, over time, just God changing my heart and making it, you know, making it to where I wanted God for God and not for what I could get out of it. And that probably happened um, around similar time, you know, when I 
first started college and I went to a Bible college so I was taking a lot of Bible and theology classes and um, just learning a lot and realizing that I, you know it was you know about what I could get out of God and, and what he did for me and not just about his glory mm. so uh, you guys moved to Little Rock nine months ago is that right yeah in August and what brought you here uh, I took a job with family life right and so um, my first interview was uh, at lunch after Redeemer. <laughs> <laughs> we went out and had lunch together and talked about uh, the possibility of the, the Goffs moving here. And uh, what do you do at Family Life? I work in the audio group, so I help produce uh, special projects right now, working on the sequel to Passport to Purity. It's called Passport to Identity. It's going to be for 14, 15, 16-year-old. There's a one for men and one for women, and so that's all I know so far at Family Life. I Got it. Nothing else. <laughs> uh, and and you work closely with John Majors in that project. Yes, I've heard John talk more than I've heard probably anyone else because <laughs> he's the narrator for the men's one, and it's about five hours long, and I get to edit it down to five hours. Yeah. It could be 35, 40, yeah. So. And, and Redeemer, how did you guys decide to come here? Well, we just... It's very similar to the church we were going to in Houston. Uh, we like good theology, but we also like good community. And we were just, that was the thing that really surprised us when we came here. Because sometimes people that are into good biblical theology get a bad rap for being introverts or not being very warm or friendly. But when we came here, it was just very, very friendly. And then we just, we love the preaching. And Anything yeah. you want to add to that? Yeah, okay, that's, that's good. Well, we are glad to have you, having gone through the new members' classes, glad to welcome you in as members. And Bruce and Maria have met with a couple of the elders and talked through questions, and they have uh, affirmed their convictions that uh, that they uh, believe, they, they agree with the, the doctrinal statement, and that they agree to, uh, uh, to follow uh, the covenant membership policy. So we're glad to have you in here. Thanks for taking a little time. Would you welcome them as new members here? Thank you, guys. And over the next uh, several weeks, as we're taking new folks through new members' classes, we're going to be introducing uh, other new members from the previous class. So we'll let you know about that. All right, it's Super Sunday time, right? So those of you who are wondering, when do I get to go? Now is the time. You can get up and head to the back, and Mr. Stefan is there, and he will show you the way, okay? So head on out to Super Sunday. We are going to begin this morning a six-week series where we are, it's a topical series. We're going to be looking at the person and work of the Holy Spirit over the next uh, six weeks. And there's a reason why we're doing this uh, now. First reason is because this is the right time of year to do this. I don't know if, if you've thought about this or if you're aware of this, but we just celebrated Easter. And Easter syncs up every year with the Jewish celebration of the Passover right? So Easter and Passover go together. Um, and, and the Passover is one of three major feasts that the Jews celebrate every year. There's Passover, and then there is the Feast of Weeks, which we also refer to as the Feast of Pentecost. And then there's the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths, which is celebrated in the fall at the harvest time. So around March, April, Passover, and you remember we talked about what does Passover commemorate? What is it what does it uh, explain? It talks about the deliverance of the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt and how God miracul miraculously spared them from the plague, the death of the sons, and how they were brought out of Egypt. They were let go. And there is a correspondence between the celebration of Passover and what we celebrate at Easter, isn't there? Where we are liberated from our slavery to sin because of the work of Christ. He has led us out of sin. So there's a connection between Passover and Easter. And if you jump ahead to the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, that's a, that's a feast that happens in September most years. It's a week-long celebration of the coming in of the harvest. And so God has said, there's a week where I want you to get together once the harvest has come in, and it's just a time of feasting and celebration. And so Jews get together for this seven-day feast every year that's the Feast of the Passover. Now, the question is, is there a corresponding New Testament uh, feast or, or celebration or holiday to the Feast of Passover? And the answer to that is, not yet, but I think there's one coming. Because I think the Feast of Tabernacles 
is a picture of the marriage feast of the Lamb that is a week-long celebration. Once the harvest is in, we will celebrate with a feast around God's throne, and we will move from our tents into our eternal home, which is also what's celebrated at the Feast of Tabernacles. And we can't be dogmatic about this. We can't say this with any certainty, but I just have this suspicion. This is even dangerous. But I just have a suspicion that if Jesus is coming back, it may be in September sometime. Okay? I, no man knows the date or the hour. Okay? I get that. All right? So I'm, I'm on record as I don't know the date or the hour, but it wouldn't surprise me. Every September, I kind of go, anyway, so that's, that's the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the third one, the one we skipped, is in the middle. It's between Passover and Tabernacles. It's called the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost Day is a Greek word that means 50. And so the Feast of Pentecost happens 50 days after the Passover. Seven weeks plus a day is the celebration of the Feast of, uh, of um, Weeks. And commentators um, talk about this, this feast, the Feast of Pentecost, is designed to celebrate the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. So the Jews get together and they thank God for giving the law on Mount Sinai. Well, we know what happened at Pentecost, right? What did God give to his church on Pentecost? the Holy Spirit. So the New Testament fulfillment of the Old Testament type in this feast is God giving spirit and life instead of law and death. Because the purpose of God giving the law in the Old Testament, this is, this is really important, God didn't give the law to people and say, here, here's the law. If you can score 87 or better on the law, you get into heaven. All right, and we have a bell curve, and so we'll, we'll, no. God gave the law for this purpose, to show people that they can never be good enough, so that when grace came, they would run to grace. The purpose of the law is to drive us to Christ. God gives the law on Mount Sinai, and God gives the Spirit to the church to say, here's where life is. So one of the reasons we're studying the person and work of the Holy Spirit over the next six Sundays is because Sunday, May 24th, is Pentecost. And we will wrap up our six-week series on the Holy Spirit on that particular Sunday. Second reason we're studying the ministry of the Holy Spirit over the next six weeks is because he is the most neglected member of the Trinity. We we God the Father, God the Son, we talk often about them, we sing often about them, but we often ignore or move past the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. Francis Chan has called the Holy Spirit the forgotten God, and I think that's true. In fact, Martin Lloyd-Jones, a preacher from a generation ago in England, said this. He said, in fact, do we have this quote? Yeah. In our day, he said, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit is either neglected or it tends to be emphasized and exaggerated in a false manner. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit is neglected because people are so afraid of the spurious, false, exaggerated, that they avoid it altogether. David Sims has called this pneumophobia. He says pneuma is the Greek word for spirit or wind or breath. He says we have a fear of the ministry of the Spirit in our midst because we've seen people emphasize the ministry of the Spirit in a way that is unbiblical. And because we look at that and that is so so ugly to us we just kind of go can we just not talk about it it's a it's a pendulum out of balance it's it's because we have seen excess that we now overcorrect and let me just say in in relation to this some people in conservative bible believing circles who are are uh, put off by how the Holy Spirit has been misrepresented in other churches. Some of them, in their silence about the Spirit, have tended to elevate the Bible to the third person of the Trinity. Some people tend to think that the, the Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Bible. And they tend to set the Holy Spirit aside. The Bible is God's great revelation to us that is absolutely useless to us unless the Holy Spirit is the one who brings the scriptures to us. So we have to remember that the Bible is a wonderful tool in God's hand. It is the reason it's living and active is not because it's words on a page, it's because the Holy Spirit breathed life into the Bible. 
So we need to understand that as much as we love God's Word, every time we love God's Word, it should remind us to love the Spirit who is the author, to love the Spirit who's the illuminator, to love the Spirit who makes God's Word understandable to us. So it's the right season of the year. We don't want to shy away from the Holy Spirit. We don't want to, uh, uh, to misrepresent, but we want to understand and embrace His work in our day. In fact, you remember Jesus said... In, in the hours right before his death, he said to his disciples, it's actually better for you if I go, because if I go, I will send another helper. Jesus said that the ministry of the helper would be more significant, this, I've got to be careful here, right? More, more helpful to us than even Jesus' earthly ministry was. Now, we can't even come into a right relationship with God apart from Jesus' earthly ministry. But the day-by-day working out of our salvation, the, the God we spend most time with is the Holy Spirit. The God who is most present, most active, most involved in our lives is the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be quoting Martin Lloyd-Jones a lot through this series. He's, he's got a great book on uh, the important doctrines of the Bible. He's got a whole book on the Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful book. But here's what he said. He said, do we always realize that it's equally sinful to ignore or neglect the doctrine of the blessed Holy Spirit? If the doctrine of, excuse me, if the doctrine of the Trinity is true, and it is true, then we are most culpable if in our thinking and in our doctrine, we do not pay the same devotion and attention to the Holy Spirit as we do to the Son and the Father. He goes on to say, I'm very ready to agree with those who say that the low spiritual life of the church today or at any time is largely due to the fact that so many fail to realize the truth concerning the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. So as we begin this six week long series on the Holy Spirit, my hope and my prayer is that God will use this study to breathe a fresh wind of passion into our lives and into our church, a fresh wind of thankfulness uh, for what the Holy Spirit has done for us and a fresh understanding of what he wants to do actively in our midst, in our church in 2015. Now, let me say, as we start this six week look at the Holy Spirit, we're not going to be able to go really deep into the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We're, we're, six weeks will allow us to dip down, okay? And I would encourage you over this six-week period to maybe select a book that you could be reading through over the next six weeks on the ministry of the Holy Spirit that would help you in your understanding so that what we're doing here Sunday and what you're doing through the week would help uh, would, would tie together. And, and I'll give you some examples. Lloyd-Jones' book on great doctrines of the Bible on the Holy Spirit's a good book. It's available on Kindle or on Amazon. You could get that. Uh, A.W. Pink has written a, a book on the Holy Spirit. John Owen wrote a, he's, he's one of the old greats. It'd be a little hard to read, but it's so rich and so deep. He wrote a book called The Holy Spirit, uh, His Gifts and Power. Or there are more recent titles. I mentioned Francis Chan's book, The Forgotten God. That would be a great starter book for those who are looking for an introduction to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. John Stott, the Anglican clergyman from uh, a generation ago, wrote a book called Baptism and Fullness, The Work of the Holy Spirit Today. It's another good kind of a basic primer on the Holy Spirit. But my point is, get a good solid book on the Holy Spirit and go deeper while we go through this study. All right, so this morning we're going to turn our attention to a lot of different passages in the Bible as we look at the Holy Spirit. Let's pray uh, here together and we'll just ask God to, to illumine His Word to us as we study it. Pray with me. Father, we are hungry this morning, hungry for Your truth. So we pray that You would feed us the bread of life as we come to Your Word. We are thirsty and we pray that You'd pour out Your living water in Your Word. Our hearts are darkened by sin. We ask that you would shine the light of your word uh, so that we can uh, see, open our eyes, that we might see wonderful things in your word, and we pray that your word would be living and active in our lives, uh, that by your spirit you would make us doers of your word and not hearers only, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Just, Just explaining this idea that 
we're, we're only going to be able to scratch the surface. I was going to bring some props this morning, but I couldn't get the props together, so I have pictures for you instead of props. So look at the pictures that I've got. Here's the first, picture one. What, what's that a picture of? That's a, that's a garden hose. Now, the reason I have a picture of a garden hose here is because if we were to uh, put our garden hose, if we were to screw it up to the faucet in our yard and turn on the garden hose, how long would it take before the water ended and no longer came out of the garden hose? Well, it'd go on forever, wouldn't it? I mean, maybe not a literal forever, but you get the idea that you turn on the spigot and it's going to go and go and go and go and not stop. This garden hose represents all there is to know about the Holy Spirit, okay? Because when you, when you try and plug in to find out about the Holy Spirit, you turn on the spigot, it doesn't stop. You will get, your yard will flood before you will exhaust what there is to know about the Holy Spirit. So this is everything there is to know about the Holy Spirit represented by this garden hose. Now, picture two represents how much of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is pictured in the Bible. So there's a lot more to know about the Holy Spirit than we find in the Bible. The Bible just tells us what God thinks is essential for us to know. So this water tower represents what the Bible has to tell us about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is still a bunch, still a lot. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, you, you'll never drain this tank, but it's not all there is to know. Here's picture three. This represents how much of what's in the Bible I, I know and have a pretty clear understanding of related to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, okay? So if the Bible has a water tank, I know about a bathtub's worth, okay? So over the next six weeks... We're going to be dipping into the bathtub just based on what I know that I have a clear understanding. And by the way, I have a clear understanding about a bathtub's worth, but here, this next slide, this is how much is in the Bible that I don't have a clear understanding about, about related to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I have more unanswered questions from the biblical text about the ministry of the Spirit than I have answered questions. So I got a bathtub's worth of knowledge and understanding. I've got about nine bathtub's worth of questions. Now, I'll just say... The bathtub worth, the, the bathtub's worth that I've got, I feel pretty confident about that. Uh, so it's it, it, the fact that I got questions doesn't mean I'm not confident about what's in the bathtub. Okay, and here's the last picture. This represents how much we're going to cover over six weeks. Okay, so we just got a few gas cans we're going to bring in and pour a little gasoline on here. So it's inexhaustible how much there is to know. The Bible tells us a, a fixed amount. I know a bathtub's worth, and we're going to do a few gas cans. Okay. And I should say, even though we're just going to be scratching the surface of the Holy Spirit, to do that, we're going to have to cover a lot of ground. And I hope you're ready to kind of move fast as we go through this. So this morning, let's, let's open this gas can. We'll see what does the Bible tell us about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we want to just focus our attention this morning on who, just, just who exactly is the Holy Spirit anyway. Who is he? That's the question we want to answer. So we're going to look at his resume to see who he is. I'm, I was going to show you his curriculum vitae, but uh, curriculum vitae is too long. We don't have time for that, so I'm going to show you just his resume. So here's the Holy Spirit's resume, just the beginning, first page of it. First thing on the resume is the name of the Holy Spirit. One writer identifies that there are 126 different names or titles for the Holy Spirit found in the Bible. Got a lot of AKAs. Uh, we, we're not going to look at all of them, okay? But the first one we want to look at is the name he's best known by. It's the name Spirit. He's known as the Holy Spirit. Holy is modifying his essence. He is Spirit. Now, you should know that both the Hebrew and the Greek words translated Spirit in your Bible can also be translated wind and breath. So, the Holy Spirit could also be thought of as the holy breath or the holy wind. Now, the, the reason that the, the Holy Spirit is, that wind and breath and spirit all kind of fit together is because uh, what's true about all three of those? They're invisible, okay? You can't see the wind. All you can see is the effects of the wind on the things around it. In the same way, we can't see the Spirit, but we can clearly see the effect of the Spirit on people, on things, on our lives. So it has that in common with wind. The other thing we know, another thing we know about wind is it has great power. 
when, when it is unleashed, it can be destructive. It can, it can do, I mean, we've seen it here with a year ago, the tornadoes that came through and ripped through this area. Wind has great power, and so indeed does the Holy Spirit. We also know that, in, in this case, not wind, but breath. To have breath is to have what? Yeah, and to not have breath is to be absent of life. And so again, the Holy Spirit is connected to this idea of breath because to have the Spirit is to have life. So not visible, powerful source of life. He is the Holy Spirit. Uh, 38 of the 126 names of the Holy Spirit are, are spirit of names. So in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is not only called the Holy Spirit, but I'll just give you a partial list. He's called the Spirit of God. He's called the Spirit of Christ. He's called the Spirit of Adoption, the Spirit of Glory, the Spirit of Grace. He's the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, the Spirit of Holiness, the Spirit of Life, the Spirit of Love, the Spirit of Might, Spirit of Power, Spirit of Prophecy, Spirit of Truth, Spirit of wisdom. Now, I just I, I list all of those real quick, right? You can see here that there's a bathtub full at each one of those names. We could dig in and just explore what does it mean that he is the spirit of might? What does it mean that he's the spirit of prophecy, the spirit of love? Each of these names tells us something different about who he is. In addition to there being spirit of names, there are also some breath of names for the Holy Spirit. He's called the breath of the Almighty. He's called the breath of God. He's called the breath of the Lord, and he's called the breath of life. So these names or these titles for the Holy Spirit should give you an idea of just how much water there is to explore when we think about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It should also indicate to you that we're talking about somebody who is multifaceted and complex. We're talking about somebody who is an amazing person, somebody who has a lot going on. In fact, this leads me to the next thing on his resume. In addition to his name being the Holy Spirit, here is his title, his position. He is God. Now, you understand, don't you, that we believe that God exists as one God who is present in three persons. All three persons, co-equal in value, all three persons sharing the same essence, but they are three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. None is less God than the other. None is more God than the other. There is a hierarchical order to how they interrelate in their relationship. So, for example... We never see in the Bible where God the Father submits himself to the Son. But we see clearly in the Bible where God the Son submits himself to the Father. There is, as we've said, a hierarchy in how they relate to one another. There's authority and structure. and There's submission within the Godhead. But they are co-equal. They have the same value and the same worth. And they are all three God. Now, to claim that the Holy Spirit is God is a pretty big claim. So how do we know that that's what the Bible teaches, that the Holy Spirit is God? Well, the first way we know it is because some of the names we just looked at make it really clear. When you call somebody the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of the Lord, when God calls him my spirit, Spirit of the living God, it's pretty clear we're talking about somebody who is God just from those names. But there's a second reason we know he is God, and that's because the Bible makes it clear in places like Acts chapter 5. And we're not going to turn to these passages because we're going to go through so many of them so fast. Acts chapter 5 is a story about two new Christians in the church, and as the church is just beginning, two people, a husband and a wife, and their names are Ananias and Sapphira. And they come to the church one day and they say, we were moved by God to give all the money we have to the church. Now, <clears throat> nobody told them they had to give all the money they had to the church. That was not a requirement. It's nothing that, that was a part of what they had to do. But they had just decided on their own that that's what they wanted to do. It was just one problem. They weren't really given all that they had to the church. So they were doing this, this show we're giving all we have, but they were keeping back a little nest egg over here. Now, again, nothing wrong with keeping a nest egg. The problem wasn't that they kept some back. The problem was what? They lied. 
They lied about how much they were giving. And so Peter, who is full of the Holy Spirit, when these folks come through, the Holy Spirit speaks to Peter, tells him they're lying. And in Acts chapter 5, Peter says to them, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of your land. While it remained unsold, it was yours. After it was sold, it was at your disposal. Why is it that you've contrived this deed in your heart? And then he says, you've not lied to man, but to God. Now, first place, he says, you just lied to the Holy Spirit. And then at the end, he says, you lied to God. Do you get a connection there? Peter's not saying you lied to two, two uh, different, well, it's two different people, but you lied to two different essences. You lied to the Holy Spirit, who is God. So the Bible clearly links together the Holy Spirit, identifying him as God. So the, his names make it clear, the Bible speaks to it. And then third, the attributes of the Holy Spirit make it clear that he is God because he has attributes that only God has. So for example, the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. He's set apart. One of the things different about the Holy Spirit than you is that he's holy and guess what? You're not, okay? Okay. The Holy Spirit is different than all other creation because he is intrinsically holy. And everything else is under the curse. So he's, he's God because he's holy. He's also eternal. Hebrews 9.14 calls him the eternal spirit. Eternality is true of God. It's only true of God. So we know that he's God because he's eternal. He's also omnipresent. He's everywhere. Psalm 139 says, where can I go? from your spirit. Where can I go and you're not there, God? There's nowhere. Where can I go from your spirit? Your spirit is omnipresent. He's everywhere. Eternality and omnipresence are true about God. And he's also omnipotent. You remember in Luke chapter 1, where the angel Gabriel comes to Mary, and he says to her, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. You're going to have a baby. She says, how can this be? I've never been with a man. And he says, the Holy, Spirit, or the, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The power of the Most High is going to overshadow you when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He shares the attribute of omnipotence with God. So he's eternal, he's omnipresent, he's omnipotent, he's the Holy Spirit. It's pretty clear that when he puts on his resume, <clears throat> I am excuse me, <clears throat> when he puts on his resume, I'm God, he can back that up. And as we'll see, as we look deeper in his resume, uh, there are things he can do that only God can do. So next thing on his resume is he is also a person. He is not a force. He is not an it. He's not an influence. He's not an emanation. He has personality. He's a person. Now, again, we want to explain what we mean by this. Number one, Jesus makes it clear when he's referring to the Holy Spirit, he always refers to him using personal pronouns. If you're reading through John chapter 16, you will find a dozen times in there when Jesus, referring to the Holy Spirit, says, he, 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 he. It's always referred to with personal pronouns. If the Holy Spirit was not a person, Jesus talking about him would say, when the Holy Spirit comes, it will do this, and it will do that, and it will do this. But he doesn't. He uses personal pronoun. He's a person. Second, he has a name, just like the Father, the Son have names. The Holy Spirit has a name. When we're told to baptize people in Matthew 28, we're to baptize them in the name of the Father, who's a person, in the name of the Son, who's a person, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, who is also a person. Third, he has personality. He has the characteristics of personhood. He has attributes that forces do not have. So, for example, the Holy Spirit thinks. He reasons. Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem council is getting together. I know we're kind of jumping around. Just stay with me as we go through this. Okay, we're moving fast. Acts chapter 15, the gospel has gone from the Jews to the Gentiles. And there's confusion about, do the Gentiles have to keep the law in order to be Christians? <clears throat> And in the midst of this, the Jerusalem Council gets together. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. In the, in the midst of this, 
the Jerusalem Council gets together to try to determine what would God have us do? How much of the law, if any, do Gentile converts have to keep in order to be Christians? And they write a letter at the end of Acts chapter 15 where they say, uh, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us that this is the result. So they're saying, the Holy Spirit has thought this through along with us, and here's what seemed good to him and to us. The Holy Spirit thinks. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person, which is in him. So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit can understand and think about God. So he we know he's a person because he has thoughts like people have. He also has emotions. He has feelings. The Bible says you can grieve the Holy Spirit. And in Romans 14, we see that the Spirit brings righteousness and peace and joy. He, he has not just thoughts, he has emotions. And he also has a will. He speaks, he acts. Uh, the Bible says, let him who has ears hear what the Spirit is saying. The one who, he's, he's the one who gives spiritual gifts and decides who gets what. It's his decision in the handing out of those spiritual gifts. He's the one who intercedes for us when we don't know how to pray. And he governs our actions. In the book of Acts, the, the, Luke says that the uh, disciples wanted to preach in Asia, but the Holy Spirit kept them from doing it. He restrained them. So he's a governor. So he has personhood, thinking, feeling, and acting. So we've seen he has a name. We've seen that he is God. We've seen that he's a person. I want to look at what's on his resume in terms of his work history. Okay, What did he do in the Old Testament and what was his job during the life and ministry of Jesus? And we're just going to look at those two areas this morning because we're going to be diving into what is his work in the church age as we go deeper into this series. But we want to look back, what did he do during the Old Testament? What did he do during the life and ministry of Jesus? Let me quote Wayne Grudem here. He says, throughout the Bible, the job of the Holy Spirit is the same. He says, the work of the Holy Spirit is to manifest the active presence of God in the world and especially in the church. So his job is to make known the work of God in the world. Now again, if he's invisible, what we see is the fruit of his work. Uh, when, when, I, when Marianne and I got married, there was a love song that was sung at a lot of weddings back in those days. It wasn't sung at our wedding, but I sang it at two or three weddings for people we know. It's a song that Paul from Peter, Paul, and Mary wrote. Some of you remember it was called The Wedding Song. You remember? He is now to be among you at the calling of your hearts. How many of you not if you know that song? Okay. Some of the old folks do. The young people go, sounds like your folky music from the old days. Yeah, it is. Okay. But the, the, the bridge of that song said, so then what's to be the reason for becoming man and wife? Is it love that brings you here or love that brings you life? And if loving is the answer, then who's the giving for? And then it asks the question, do you believe in something that you've never seen before? And it answers that question, there is love. Have you ever seen love? You, you can't see love, can you? All you can see is what love does, but you can't see the love itself right? Same is true with the Holy Spirit. We can't see the Spirit, but we can see clearly the work of the Spirit in our world around us. And that's part of what we want to look at as we go forward. It's his job to make visible the work of God, not to make himself visible, but to make the work visible. Oh, his first work in the Old Testament. Let's talk about that. Now, let me just say, as you go into the Old Testament, you're getting into some murky water. Because the way the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament and the way the Holy Spirit works in the New Testament or after the day of Pentecost, there's a difference. But trying to identify exactly what those differences are gets a little dicey. 
Not everybody agrees on how we understand those differences exactly. What we all know is that something happened on Pentecost that ushered in the new administration of the Spirit that was different than it had been before. So we're going to look at some of what we know about how it was different then than it is today. Uh, A.W. Pink says this about the Holy Spirit prior to Pentecost. He says, The Spirit had not yet been given in His full administrative authority. He was not yet publicly manifest here on earth. All believers in every age had been sanctified and comforted by Him, but the ministration of the Spirit was not at that time fully introduced. The outpouring of the Spirit, the plentitude of His miraculous gifts had not then taken place. So, before Pentecost, he was present, he was at work. He, there, he, it wasn't like he just took a vacation from creation to Pentecost. He was busy, but it was not his full administration. Here's what we do know about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. He shows up early. Okay, Genesis 1, 2. Verse 2, the earth was without form and void, darkness covered the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Doesn't take long to get into the Bible, to get into creation, before the Holy Spirit is revealed. In the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth, and the Holy Spirit is right there, active, taking part in creation. God speaks, and the Holy Spirit works in creation. By the way, it's Father, Son, and Spirit. We read in the New Testament that about Jesus that all things were created by Him and for Him. So it's not like Jesus took off during that week. All three of them are involved and engaged. Who is doing what? How does it work? We don't, that's part of the water tower. No, that's, that's beyond the water power. That's back to the hose. We don't have the, the Bible doesn't give us that. Just gives us little insights, some drips of water on that one. But the Holy Spirit was there right at the beginning, involved in creation. And in fact, in Genesis chapter 2, God makes Adam. Remember, what does God use as the raw material for Adam? What's he use? Dust. He forms him out of the dust of the earth. So he puts together a man out of mud. All right? And how does he turn the mud into a human being? He breathes into him breathes life into his nostrils. What's the word breath the same as? Spirit. So he is breathing the spirit into Adam that takes him from mud to human being. The spirit is a part of the creative force that brings life to the world. Job says in Job 33, the spirit of God has made me, the breath of the Almighty gives me life. And that's true for everybody. So he was involved in creation. Second, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was involved in regeneration. Regeneration. We're going to talk more about this next week when we look at the Holy Spirit's work in making things new, making people new, taking dead people and bringing them to life. But just as people today are brought from death to life through the power of the Holy Spirit, the same was true for Abraham. The same was true for all Old Testament saints. The only way that somebody could come into an understanding of who God is, into a saving faith, is through the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, So he was present in bringing people from darkness. You need to understand that all, Paul tells us this in Romans chapter 2, all who were in Israel were not Israel. All who were descendants of Abraham physically were not descendants of Abraham spiritually. All who, are, who, who were Jews were not believers. Many of them thought their Jewishness was enough for them to be beneficiaries of God's blessing. But the Bible makes it clear it's not your Jewishness, it's your faith in God. And that's why David in the Old Testament says things like, I remember reading Psalm 51. David says, you do not require sacrifices, Lord. If you did, I would give them. And I go, well, David, no, God does require sacrifices. I read that part. What David is saying is, then he goes on to say, the sacrifice you require is a broken and a contrite spirit. He's saying, I get it now. I get it that the sacrifices aren't what merit God's blessing, but the sacrifice of a broken and contrite spirit. So David is saying, I I get the New Testament now even in the Old Testament. I get that this is all pointing to something greater and that the sacrifices don't earn me God's favor, but that I have to have a broken spirit. How did David figure that out? The Holy Spirit. 
Nobody in the Old Testament got to that understanding apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. So he was active in creation. He's active in regeneration or recreation. Here's the third thing. The Holy Spirit is active in the giving of special gifts and power and understanding to people in the Old Testament. He would come on Old Testament believers to give them special power, special gifting to do certain things at certain times. And it wasn't a permanent uh, installment of that gifting. So when he came on somebody, it could be a temporary, here's the moment. So for example, Samson, chained up, and he needs strength to break the chains. The Bible says the Spirit came on Samson, and he was able to pull down the columns. Okay, Samson, It wasn't his hair, it was the Spirit that did it. And Samson didn't have that as a permanent endowment. It, God gave him special strength in that moment. Same is true for others. God gave Joseph, through the Spirit, the ability to, uh, to uh, comprehend the dreams of Pharaoh, to interpret those dreams. Uh, the book of Judges says the Spirit of the Lord was the one who outfitted Gideon for battle. So the Spirit would come on Old Testament believers when they needed it for that momentary endowment. It was also the Spirit who spoke through the prophets. What we have when we read the book of Isaiah is the word of the Lord through Isaiah. That's the Spirit giving Isaiah that understanding. And again, there are murky issues here about the indwelling and the permanence. And we we read about Saul who had the Holy Spirit come on him. And we wonder, was Saul even a believer because he was consulting witches? And, you know, there are all kinds of questions that you get into related to that. And I, I don't have all the answers. That's, that's, uh, that may be in the water tower. It may be in the hose. I don't know. But it's not my bathtub, okay? So I'm just telling you here, we're going to have to leave those murky because not only don't we have the time to get into it, I don't have the scholarly insight to get into it, okay? So let's move from the Old Testament. That's how the Holy Spirit's at work in the Old Testament. Here's how he's at work in the life of Jesus. First of all, we've already seen that the Holy Spirit was active in the conception of Jesus. The The Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she conceived. The Holy Spirit was the one who brought about the miraculous conception, the virgin conception of Mary. It was through the work, through the power of the Holy Spirit, who all along is the giver of life. He's the one who is bringing life into the world in creation. He's the one who breathes life into Adam's nostrils and brings him alive. Now here he is bringing life to Mary through the virgin conception. Uh, and, but beyond just conception, we need to get our heads around the idea that Jesus' life and ministry was lived out in total dependence on the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. Uh, some of you remember Dr. Bruce Ware was here a couple of years ago, and we spent a, a fascinating evening. In fact, I would tell you if, you, if you want something really interesting to listen to, you can download the audio from our website at RedeemerLR.org where Dr. Bruce Ware talked about the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus. And I think it was probably the first time I'd pulled back to to consider that Jesus' obedience to the Father, Jesus' faithfulness in ministry, came from Jesus' dependence on the Holy Spirit in his life, not from Jesus just being Jesus. Jesus, without the Holy Spirit, could not have accomplished the work Jesus was sent to do. Jesus lived his life in dependence on the Holy Spirit. Let me quote Dr. Ware here. Here's what he said. The only way to make sense, then, of of the fact that Jesus came in the power of the Spirit is to understand that he lived his life fundamentally as a man, and as such, he relied on the Spirit to provide the power, grace, knowledge, wisdom, direction, and enablement that he needed moment by moment, day by day, to fulfill the mission that the Father sent him to accomplish. Now, when we say he lived his life fundamentally as a man, we're not saying that he was not God when he did that. What we're saying is that he put his divinity out. Uh, out of reach for the moment. Actually, he could have gotten to it any time he wanted to, but he limited his access to his divinity so that he could, as a sympathetic high priest, live out his earthly life in reliance on the Holy Spirit in the same way that you and I have to live it out and, and succeed in the mission. He was living in that fullness of humanity. This is why the Bible writers make it clear that when Jesus is baptized, what happens at the end of his baptism? 
Holy Spirit comes down, descends like a dove, rests on him. God says, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. God is saying, this is my son. I'm sending my spirit to empower him to do the mission that we're sending him to. Now, he'd had the spirit before that, but this is a visible representation. This is a statement to people. The Holy Spirit is coming for the ministry of Jesus. And then the next thing we see in Luke, in Luke chapter 4, it says, the spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. So Jesus is relying on the leading of the Holy Spirit. And at the end of that, it says, uh, after his temptation, he returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And then the next thing that happens is a chapter later, he's in Galilee, he's in Capernaum at the synagogue, and he opens the scroll and he turns to Isaiah. And what does it say? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. We... We read past these things and kind of just go, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, this is, this is the work of the Spirit in the life of Jesus. He had to rely on the Spirit in his ministry, just like you and I have to rely on the Spirit to live a life that's pleasing to God. And of course, in the last hour of Jesus' life on earth, he told the disciples, it's going to be good for you that I go, because if I go, I'm going to send you the Spirit. And that promise is realized on the day of Pentecost, when God pours out his Spirit and fulfills the prophecy from Joel chapter 2. And we're going to look at that more in the weeks to come. Now, we've covered a lot of ground, a lot of verses this morning. I hope hope your head's not spinning, but here's the, here's the main thing I want us to get from looking at the Holy Spirit's resume. Uh, remember, it's a resume, not a curriculum vitae, because a curriculum vitae has a lot more information. And this is just the synopsis. I, I want you to understand he is an amazing person. He is God, and that he is a gift given to every person who is a child of God to be a friend, a guide, a companion, a helper, a comforter, a counselor, and an advocate. He is God's gift to you so that you can live a life pleasing to God, free from sin, and walking in the power of the Spirit. Think of it this way. God the Father sent His Spirit to live with you. All analogies break down, so just bear with me on this. But imagine that the Holy Spirit was going to be a foreign exchange student who's going to come and live at your house, okay? God sends the, the foreign exchange student, he's going to not only come live at your house, but he's going to go with you to work where you go. He's going to stay with you as you're taking care of the kids. He is with you. This foreign exchange student won't go away, all right? He's always there with you. He comes in, and, and here's what you learn about this foreign exchange student who's come to live in your house. He's royalty. He is a part of the royal family in the kingdom that he's come from, and all of the, the benefits of the kingdom come with him. So this foreign exchange student who's in your house says, look, if you ever need anything, let me know. If I can ever help you in any way, let me know. As long as what you need is consistent with, the, with our kingdom, as long as what you need is what represents the values of the kingdom, I'll help. I'll pour it out. He's there with you all the time. Imagine that as the gift God's given you. Or think of it this way. When you came, when you confessed your sin and you turned to Christ, you surrendered your life to Jesus... It's like, and, and you became a child of God, it's like if you were a business, what happened was the old owner of the business sold, and there's a new owner that's come in and taken over the business of your life. So you came, when you came to Christ, the old owner got fired, and the, a new owner came in to manage it. The new CEO who comes in to now be the CEO of your life. And he comes to be not just a boss, but to be a friend. He comes to be a mentor and a guide. And to he's got an open door policy. If you've got any issues, he says, bring them to me. We'll work on these. We'll get these issues resolved. Now, think back to the resume. The foreign exchange student, the new boss, that's a pretty amazing person who, want, who has that kind of relationship with you and so the main point I want you to see is that the Holy Spirit is not some distant, detached being, some force, something out there that is kind of arm's length from you. He is here. He is the imminent presence of God in your life. He's personal, and he's here to attach himself to you and be a source of life and truth for you. And the closer your relationship with the Holy Spirit, the more like Jesus you become. The closer all of us are with the Holy Spirit, the more like Jesus 
the church becomes, the better our families become, the more our society becomes like the kingdom of God, the better our world would be. The gift of the Holy Spirit is a great gift from God, but we need to keep in mind that this is a gift that came at a price. You didn't have to pay a cent to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit from God, but God had to pay a price to be able to give you the Holy Spirit as the source of life and truth. And the price he paid was the offering of his son. God sent Jesus, who lived the perfect sinless life that you were meant to live and that all of us had failed at. Jesus did what we could not do, did not do. And Jesus died then in our place, paying the penalty for the sin that we'd committed so that our relationship with God can be reconciled in Christ. And the Holy Spirit is a gift that comes to us only because Jesus paid the price and only when we acknowledge that the work of Jesus on the cross for our benefit, that that we, it's it's a new life for us. We we trust, we believe, we're going to follow God. And that's what's pictured for us here at the communion table. And that's why we take communion each week here at Redeemer, to remind ourselves of the price that God paid so that we can have life, so that we can have hope, so that there is purpose, so that there is uh, obedience. What's pictured up here in bread and juice is the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus, the price that God paid so that we could have His Holy Spirit. Now, we practice open communion here at Redeemer, which means that if you're here as a visitor, you, but you're, you're here as a visitor, but you know and you love Christ, you're welcome at the table because the the church is universal and the body and the blood of Christ are for all who know and love Jesus. And so we we trust that if you're here and you do know and love Jesus, you can come to the table and join with us. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, somebody brought you and you're here kind of exploring or examining what we're talking about, we're, we're thrilled that you're here, we're glad that you're here. We just ask you during this time, rather than coming and receiving the bread and the cup, just stay where you are and think about Uh, who we've talked about this morning, our amazing God, God the Holy Spirit, His presence with us. And I'd love to talk to you more about that after the service as we have lunch today. Uh, That'd be a great conversation to have. We'd love to do that, okay? So we're going to give you just a minute to prepare your heart to come down the outer aisles, receive the elements, take them back through the center aisle to your seat, and hold on to the elements, and we'll receive uh, these elements together here in just a minute. you are ready, come and receive this morning.
at the Passover meal on the night before he was crucified, Jesus took the bread and after he had blessed it, he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you receive this, remember me. He would go on to explain to them about the ministry of the Spirit in their lives. But his broken body was the price necessary for us to be able to receive the fullness of the Spirit and the administration of the Spirit in the new covenant. And so, Lord Jesus, this morning as we take this bread, we do reflect on the fact that the great gift that you've given us in your Spirit came with a cost, came at a price. And we thank you for the price you paid for us. We receive this with grateful hearts. We feast on Christ in our heart. Amen. In the same way, when the meal was concluded, Jesus took the cup, and after he had blessed it, he passed it. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, my blood, shed for the remission of your sins. As often as you receive this, remember me. And so again this morning, Lord, we do remember with grateful hearts your sacrifice for us. We thank you that our sin has been dealt with that it's been put away because you paid the price. We feast on Christ in our hearts and we receive this with a grateful heart. Amen. If you'll stand, we're going to sing the last verse of Wonderful, Merciful Savior, the verse about the Holy Spirit, and then I'll dismiss us with a benediction so that we can go have lunch together. All right? Counselor, Comforter, Keeper, Spirit, we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we've hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that And I receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, give you peace. The Lord lift up his countenance and be gracious unto you. Go in peace, go in Christ. Amen. Amen. We're going to begin serving lunch immediately. So as you want to loop your way back around uh, by the nursery, back into the kitchen, lunch is all set up back there. We've got tables set up and... Uh, Hope you'll stay for lunch.